hello and welcome to Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 3, Oathbreaker. Um, who the Oathbreaker is exactly, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I've come up with a couple of possibilities, um, one being Jon Snow, uh, although he isn't technically breaking his oath because he did die um, and then come back, so... You know, he, he he lived out his oath to the Night Watch. Um, I don't think they took into account when they were making this contract that somebody might actually die and then come back. But, so that might be the oath breaker. Uh, the other one would possibly be uh, Small John Umber uh, when he broke his oath or his family's oath to the Starks by delivering Rickon Stark to Ramsay Bolton towards the end of the episode. But we'll get there. I'm just trying to sort out the Oathbreaker title at the beginning. But a great episode. Um, a lot's happening. Um, you know, we touched on a few people we haven't seen previously. Rickon's back, although what exactly he's supposed to be doing, I'm not entirely sure. He hasn't exactly had the strongest storyline all the way through the series. We haven't seen him for two, possibly three seasons. So I'm not entirely sure what his return's going to herald. Um... But once again, the episode book ended with um, uh, Castle Black uh, and at the wall, uh, beginning and end. So we'll start with there. What I'll do is I'll put them both together, just to make it easier. Uh, so obviously you start the episode where we ended the previous one, with John waking up, coming back to life, and we see that Sir Davos is still in the room by the door, standing watching this happen. Um, which must have been a bit of a shock, but it was what he was hoping to happen. So obviously we go through a few minutes of, of John just trying to get his wits together, which of course you would do in Christ. You know, you, get, you come back to life. I mean, that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna throw anyone. Um, but Davos, as always, is level-headed. He's there. He's he grounds John and tries to help him. You know, steady himself because um, John is obviously feeling. Not only the fact that he's come back to life and he's wondering how that happened, why he's there, you know, but also the betrayal of the Night Watch. Um, that he was actually stabbed by, you know, his fellow Night Watch brothers, you know, and the, the betrayal of that is obviously hanging heavy on him and he, he has lost his faith in himself um, and that he was doing the right thing. And as he says to, you know, Davos, you know, I tried to do the right thing, but I failed. Uh, and Sir so Davos, being Sir Davos, um, probably the best counsellor uh, in Westeros at this time, um, says to him quite leverly, good, you failed, now get out there and fail again. Because he understands that John is perhaps the most honourable man currently in a leadership position that Davos, at least, has, has ever seen. I mean, he served Stannis all those, all those years. But he always had his doubts. He tried to be loyal. He tried to do the right thing for Stannis. He tried to back him up, you know, give him good counsel. And his counsel was always good. But Stannis just didn't want to listen to him. And now Davos finds himself with Jon Stark, uh, well, Jon Snow, hopefully Jon Stark at some point, but Jon Snow, who has always acted honourably, always acted for the good, uh, and tried to do the right thing. And I think the two of them together will be a powerful force to be reckoned with. Um, Davos's wise counsel and, you know, John's leadership abilities, because he is a good leader, and he did lead the Night Watch well. And I think a, a vast majority of the Night Watch, um, you know, liked him and were behind him. And it was just Sir Arisa and a few of the others there that decided to take matters into their own hands. Um, but I've got to admit, although I haven't liked Sir Alistair throughout the, the series, I mean, the guy is a dick, and you, <laughs> you know, it was one of those characters that was in there for you to hate. Um, and he's always been a stick in the mud, and, you know... He, but I've got to give him points. When he was standing at the gallows, about to be hung, he stood by his convictions. Um, you know, and you could, he tried to explain to John, you know, I fought, I lost, I'm prepared to die, knowing I tried to do the right thing. In, in his mind, that was the right thing to get rid of John. So, 
you know, the man stood by his convictions and, you know, points for that, and he died head held high. Um, there's been some debate about John coming back, what would he be? Would he be a lesser character? You know, would he have been, would he have changed? Being dead, would he have changed? Would he come back more evil, you know, darker, grittier? You know, would he have lost some of his um, goodness? And if that is so, it's not shown in this episode. He really is the, the, the Jon Snow we've always known. Um, you know, he, he takes responsibility for hanging the conspirators himself. Um, he faces them each individually as they're standing on the gallows. And he is obviously saddened. And, and when it comes to, you know, chopping the rope to hang them, he obviously hesitates. And he doesn't want to do it. You know, you can tell, you can see it in his face. He doesn't want to do it. Um, but he does. And, and the four conspirators, the four people who assassinated him, die, get hung. Um, and then at the end, he takes off the cloak of the Lord High Commander and gives it to Ed and says that his watch is finished. Now, once again, I think this is John doing the honourable thing. The blood of the four men who, who got hung is on John's hands. So he's passing the title of Lord Commander to Ed with a clean slate. Ed doesn't have to worry about people you know, perhaps thinking, you know, we need to revenge ourselves on Ed because of those four people who died. It wasn't Ed's choice, it was John's. And John carried out the execution. So Ed is a free man now. He's got, he, if the Lord High Commander's title um, is backed up by the rest of the Night Watch, then he, he starts, as I say, with a clean slate. And probably a lot of men will be loyal to him because he's John's successor. Um, but then what happens with John? You know, he's now left the Night Watch, but I'm sure the wildlings who consider him uh, some form of God, it seems, um, will follow him wherever he goes. So he's already got an army. He's got an army of wildlings here. So what's he going to do? Is he going to march on Winterfell? Okay, that would seem perhaps, once he's brought up to speed on what's going on, that would perhaps be the logical choice. Does Sansa get to him before he gets to Winterfell? possible. Have the two Starks side by side. Um, you know, as, as I said last week, my f one of my theories is that Ramsay Bolton has made Sansa pregnant. And if so, and if she meets up with John, and the months drag by and she has a son or a daughter, I don't think it really make either difference, they would be the heir to the Bolton family name. So would that mean that Ramsay's current allies, would they perhaps think, okay, we can either stay with Ramsay, this psychotic idiot who could turn on us at any moment and isn't the smartest tool, in, you know, they're not the sharpest tool in the box. Do we stay with him or do we give our loyalty to this new heir of the House Bolton and join forces with Sansa Stark and Jon Snow? You know, at least they would have a legitimate reason for changing their allegiance. They're still staying with House Bolton, which is where they swore their allegiance. They're just changing it from Ramsay to Sansa's kid, if Sansa has a kid. You know, like I say, it's just my theory, but that would then give John and Sansa a huge army. You know, probably most of the Northern Houses would side with him as, as a Stark, um, or side with Sansa. Um, the Boltons would be finished. Uh, we, Ramsay's definitely needing his comeuppance. Um, so there's a lot going on up north. You know, um, what's going to happen there? Um, but then the show moves on quickly to a ship out at sea in a storm, and we see Sam and Gilly. Uh, um, I don't really know why they wasted their time on this. You know, they've got 10 episodes this season and they've got so much story to get through. We didn't need these five minutes or however long it was showing Sam throwing up and him and Gilly having a nice chat on this boat. They could have easily picked up the story um, from when they get to Old Town, I think, or, or wherever Sam's going to learn to be this Meister. I think it's Old Town. Um, they could have picked it up there. We didn't need this this bit on the ship, it was just a break in the story that gave us nothing that we needed to know. Um, as I say, they haven't got much time, so why they didn't just pack in more 
story on important storylines. I, I don't know. It's all very... I mean, who really cares about Sam's storyline, to be honest? I mean, him and Gilly are great characters, and everyone loves them. Um, <clears throat> you know, and they're nice people, but his actual storyline in the book, as far as we know so far, isn't that important. You know, in the book, he gets to Old Town, he starts to train as a Meister, you know, but that's... Well, they're going to show us show him sitting in a library studying, you know, see him, see him doing coursework. I mean, that doesn't sound very uh, entertaining or exciting for a Game of Thrones episode. Um, but anyway, um, and then we go back to Bran. <coughs> now, this was quite an interesting scene. Bran having another flashback, this time again of his dad, slightly older, but um, still in his youth. Uh, Eddard Stark and uh, five or six of his men. Uh, go to the Tower of Joy to rescue um, Eddard's sister, Lyanna, um, who has been taken captive by Rhaegar. Um, now, when they get there, um, there are two knights of the, of the King's Guard waiting to defend the tower, um, and they tell Ed that they were ordered to stay there by Rhaegar. Um, and Eddard just says, you know, where's my sister? And then the, the fight starts, and it is a fantastically choreographed sword fight. I mean, it really is. Um, you got, you got swords flying everywhere. you got the, the, the one of the king's guard using two long swords at the same time, and he takes out about two-thirds of Eddard's men. Uh, the other knight takes out another one or two before he gets stabbed, which leaves Eddard and this guy face to face. Now, according to the story that Eddard has told everyone since his return from the wars, he killed this man one on one. That's what he told his kids. But as we see in this flashback, uh, Eddard's about to die. He's been disarmed and he's just about to be stabbed when one of his other men who was wounded rises up behind this knight and stabs him in the back giving Eddard enough time to pick up his sword uh, and cut the guy's throat. So we know now, and Bran knows because he's watching this, that his father lied about this. And to be fair, in the books, and I don't know if it comes over as much in the TV series, but in the books, Eddard always carried this dishonour with him, or what he classed as a dishonourable act, through his life. He, these two knights watch, uh, sorry, these two king's guard were both honourable men and renowned throughout the kingdoms. Um, and if he had have Eddard had killed them one on one, that would have been fine. But the fact that he ended up killing the guy while he was already dying and on his knees before him and unable to defend himself, you know, it's 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 a dishonor that Eddard carried with him throughout his life. Um, but then you see him, you hear a woman cry out from the tower, and Eddard turns and starts running towards the stairs, and Bran cries out his dad or, or cries out father. Eddard stops and looks around. So now the question is, did he hear Bran? Or was it just the wind or some other noise that made him turn around? We don't know. Who's in the tower? We're assuming Lyanna. Um, and if it is, then we're also assuming that she's having her son. And the theory currently is that it's Jon Snow, uh, the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna Stark. Um, and Eddard Stark um, takes the baby um, and promises his his sister, who dies, I believe, during childbirth, that he will protect the boy and take him as his own. So when he gets back to Winterfell with this baby in his arms, he tells Caitlin Stark, his wife, that he had an affair while he was away at war, and this is the son. And that's why Caitlin hated John throughout the years of him growing up. But that's the theory, that's the pr prominent theory at the moment, is that Lyanna gives birth to Jon Snow. Um, but I think we're probably going to see that sooner rather than later. If that's so, then Jon has Targaryen blood in his, in his veins, which opens up a whole new realm of possibilities, especially where dragons are concerned. Um, but then he's the half-brother of Daenerys. What happens there? You know, do they join up at some point if Daenerys finally gets across the ocean to Westeros? Do they join up? 
you know, it would open up so many doors, um, and there'd be a lot, lot of great episodes to come if that is where they go with this. Um, and also, the Free-Eyed Raven tells Bran when they go back to the cave that Bran won't be in that cave forever, that he will be able to leave, but he has to learn everything first, which sounds like it's going to take quite a bit of time. I'm sure they'll brush over a lot of it. But what will his powers be? We already know that he can go and see the past, but will he be able to see the future, maybe? Um, will he be able to affect the past? You know, if, if Eddard Stark did hear Bran call his name, or call out father, that means that Bran can affect the past somehow, and that's dangerous. I mean, that could change everything. So we don't know what Bran's powers are going to be, but he's obviously going to be very powerful. He can walk, and he can see the past, and what else? So, that's something else to look forward to. Daenerys. Um, we see Daenerys finally gets to Dosh Kaleen, where the, uh, the crones or the wives of killed or murdered Carls have to go after the, the Carls are dead. But she's basically told that um, the Carls are all gathering outside to decide which cities to go and sack and you know, basically future war plans, but also to decide on Daenerys' fate. Because according to their law, when Khal Drogo died, she should have come straight to this, straight to uh, Dosh Kaleen. But she didn't. She went off, um, saved those three cities, you know, went out into the world, and that's against the, the Dothraki law. So now she has to answer for that. The question is, how much power do the Dosh Kaleen have? I mean, they are basically the religion of the Dothraki. They, they are seers, as I said. They head up the Dothraki religion, so they have power. Um, and most of the Khals probably fear them. So in council, how much weight do they have over the Khals' decisions? I mean, fine, all these Khals are outside deciding what's going to happen with Daenerys. And she's told by one of the, the women that the, her best option um, is that the Khals will decide to leave her here at Dosh Kaleen. But do the Khals decide this? Or can you know the seers and the old women butt in and say, well, look, just leave her here with us and you go about your war? We don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. Um, but then that brings us back to Marine, where we have Tyrion and Grey Worm and Missandei all sitting around a table waiting for Varys, who's off questioning uh, Vala, who's a young lady who's in league with the Sons of the Harpy. And Varys has her brought to the council chambers, or, or the main chamber in Marine, where Daenerys would normally rule from, <clears throat> and starts to question her. And the girl is obviously scared uh, that she's going to be tortured, you know, and, and Varys is quite calm, like he always is, you know, he's nice, he's calm, he's friendly, you know, he vaguely threatens Vala's son saying, well, you know, what would happen to your son if you died, you know, or, you know, you can't risk your son's life, um, or to get her to tell him what he needs to know. But basically, as he says in the episode, I want to be your friend, I want to make you happy, I want to do what will be best for you. And in the end, he offers her the option of leaving on a ship with a bag full of silver, her and her son, to start a new life somewhere else. And in doing so, he gets the answers that he needs. Basically, the Sons of the Harpy are being funded by the two other cities that Daenerys had sacked and taken over and released the slaves from, that have now gone back to their old ways. So the Sons of the Harpy are being funded by these big cities, to destroy Marine and kill Daenerys. We figured we sort of figured that anyway. I mean that was a logical assumption, but now Varys, Tyrion, Grey Worm and Missande know it for sure. But that that's pretty much all we get out of out of Marine for this episode. And then we go to King's Landing. Now this is interesting. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff happened here. Kyburn who's... So this is slightly confusing. I thought Kyburn, the guy in the black robe, was the new Grand Meister. That Pycelle had been uh, 
taken out of that role last season by Cersei. And Kyburn, her new favourite, had been put in that role. That's what I've remembered. I might be wrong, but I'm sure that's what I remember. But you see Kyburn down in his basement, cellar, lab, workshop, whatever you want to call it. He's got a load of kids who turn out to be the little birds that Varys used to use to get information about what was going on in King's Landing. Um, and Kyburn gets them to now work for him. So basically it's like his Baker Street Irregulars. You know, he's Sherlock Holmes and there is Baker Street in the regulars. <laughs> but he, he gets them to work for him now and they leave just as Cersei, Jamie, and the giant mountain uh, come into the cellar. And uh, Cersei orders Kyburn to send spies to the north, basically everywhere, so she can find out what people are saying about her. Because she wants to know anyone who says anything bad about her and she will deal with them. So she's obviously even more paranoid now than she used to be. Um, and Jamie's just standing there and backing her up, obviously. But then they go to the small council, which is currently in session. Now, the small council, at this point, is made up of uh, Kevin Lannister, so Cersei and Jamie's uncle, uh, Tywin Lannister's brother, and he's currently the Hand of the King, so he's in charge of the small council. You've got Lady Tyrell, who's Marjorie's grandmother, um, Mace Tyrell, Marjorie's dad, and Meister Parcell. Now this is where I was confused because Meister Parcell shouldn't be on the small council if he was, if his position as Grand Meister was taken away by Cersei. Kyburn should be there. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. But anyway, um, Kevin Lannister has, has never liked Jamie and Cersei's rule. He, I, c I can't remember if he knows, I think he knows, or he heavily suspects uh, that they're having incest. And he doesn't, he never wanted to be the king's hand anyway, but he figured after Tywin died, he, ha he had to keep a steady hand on Tommen. So Kevin has never liked them. And they basically sit down and say, look, we've got, you know, Jamie and Cersei sit down and say, look, we've got a lot to talk about, there's a lot going on. And Kevin says, well, you might be able to, you know, stop us from getting rid of you. We don't want you here, and you might be able to stop us from getting rid of you. But there, there's no way you can stop us from leaving. So he stands up and walks out, followed by the rest of the small council, leaving Jamie and Cersei sitting there alone. Now, that was a ballsy move. I mean, Kevin Lannister isn't scared of Cersei or Jamie, um, and Lady Tyrell, the grandmother, she certainly isn't. She was the one wearing the trousers in the Tyrell family at the moment. But uh, Marjorie's dad, um, Mace Tyrell, he was made master of the coin by Cersei, and Meister Parcell has always been a Cersei man. So for them two to stand and walk out, it took a lot of balls, and I was surprised that they did it. So now Cersei and Jamie know that the small council aren't on side with them. So what are they left with? Jamie's in charge of the King's Guard, so he's probably got a dozen of the best swordsmen in the realm. But they don't have an army. Tommen is the king. Tommen's got the army. But he might not be as under the thumb of Cersei as we think. You know, Cersei obviously hopes he is. And she's got Jamie on side to try and help her. But in this episode, you see Tommen go to the High Sparrow to try and get permission for Cersei to see her daughter's um, tomb, where she was buried. And after a slightly icy start, they end up sitting together, um, having a really nice conversation. You know, the High Sparrow explaining about the religion, you know, how religion helps the king to rule the kingdom, how the religion and um, you know, the king and royalty are the two pillars that hold up the kingdom. And at the end, they ha they're having a really nice discussion. Toman is actually seeming to be listening to the High Sparrow and, you know, actually liking what he's saying, you know, or, or at least being open to what the man's saying. So that opens up another doorway. I mean, what if the High Sparrow starts to mentor Toman in some way, trying to get him on side, sway him to back him rather than Cersei. Toman is the king, so the authority is with him. So what if he turns away from Jamie and Cersei? What if he backs the High Sparrow? I mean, <laughs> there's a lot going on in King's Landing at the moment, and the Lannisters, 
I don't know. I mean, the Lannister army will probably side with Jaime, but the king, you know, has control of the rest of the the rest of the realm. So here's the power, really. Even if Cersei and Jaime don't want to see it, Tommen is the power at the moment. He just has to learn how to use it. The High Sparrow might be the man to show him the way. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. But then we head off to see Arya, who's still blind at this point, still being funked around by the Waif with her quarterstaff. But as that scene plays out, obviously it's like a training scene. So over a period of time, Arya gets better and better and better, and eventually she can parry the Waif's blows. And at that point, the Waif steps back, and Jack and Hagar turns up and starts questioning her again. You know, uh, who are you? What is your name? And she keeps replying that she's no one. And once again, he offers her her sight you know, if she tells him who she is. And once again, she says she's no one. So he leads her to the main hall in the temple uh, where you have that um, pool of black water, the poison, that people who want to give up their lives come to, they drink, and they die in the temple. So we know that poison, that water is poison to kills. But Jacken sits on the edge of the pool and fills a cup of water and hands it to Arya and tells her that if she is truly no one, then she has nothing to fear. So Arya takes the cup and drinks it, and a few seconds later when she opens her eyes, she can see again. And she says very confidently, I am no one. Now, the question is, does she believe that? Has she been mind brainwashed by Jack and Hagar and the Waif? Does she actually believe she hears no one now? So she can become an assassin, you now a faceless man? Or is she still playing the game? Is she still Arya Stark, but she's trying to fool everyone into thinking that she is no one, but she survived the poison? So was it a ploy by Jack N? You know, he knew the poison wouldn't hurt her somehow, and he was just testing it. Yeah, we don't know. All very interesting to see where Arya goes from here, because now she's almost fully trained up. Hopefully we're going to get more training. We want to see her storyline move on now. But what's going to happen to her? If she is a faceless assassin now, then what happens? Does she get sent back to Westeros to kill people? Will she meet any of her family? If she does, does that break her out of the spell? If she is playing a game, and she knows she's still Arya Stark, what then? Does she seek revenge on the people on her list? You know, if so, what, what happens when she breaks the rules again? Do they come after her? I mean, <laughs> this is the thing about Game of Thrones. There are so many interesting storylines and plot points here, and it can go in so many different ways that you never know what's going to happen until you watch the episode. And only then can you say, yep, okay, that's, that's it. That, okay, now we know. That's laid down. That's in stone. But then lastly, we go to Ramsay, back at Winterfell, who is now the Warden of the North. Now he killed his dad. And he's in a meeting with Small John Umber. Now, Small John, the son of Great John Umber, who was a loyal supporter of Rob Stark before the Red Wedding, um, turns out to now be the head of the Umber family his dad having died. We don't know exactly how his dad died. In the books, Great John Umber wasn't present at the at the Red Wedding, so he survived that. But in the episode, Small John says to Ramsay that his dad has died, and that if he hadn't have died, Small John would have maybe killed him like Ramsay killed uh, Roose Bolton. But he's not having any of Ramsay's um, diplomatic talk. <laughs> he calls him Roose Bolton several names. Um, you know, and he, he's not he's not taking in Ramsay at all. He's, he, he knows exactly who Ramsay is. But as Ramsay starts to question, you know, why are you here then? You know, what, what, how can you prove your loyalty? <clears throat> Small John brings in two hooded figures, and when you hunt, when he unhoods them, we find out it's Osha and Rickon Stark. Now, as I say, Rickon's been out of it for two or three seasons now, and he never had a strong storyline to start with. And also to prove his loyalty, Small John Umbar throws the head of Rickon's direwolf on a table close by. So that's another direwolf down. So out of all of those direwolves we saw in the first episode of the first season, 
you know, there's probably like one or two left. We well, Ghost is obviously still around. I think Arya's Great Wolf is in the wild somewhere. Sansa's died. Rob's died. Yeah, so I think we're probably down to just two now. Can't remember if Brands is still around. Could be. So we would free, free direwolves. But still, they keep dropping like flies. These creatures that are supposed to be so powerful and strong, and they just keep getting killed off. And it's a shame because they're one beautiful, beautiful animals. But anyway, that's that's how it that how that's how that ends. So now. Ramsey has the Umber family allied with him, and the Umbers are the family that hold the hold the land north of Winterfell, between Winterfell and um, the Wall. So now they are the first people who are going to be in the line of fire if John brings the Wildlings south. So it'd be interesting to see what happens there, because obviously the Umber family have always been loyal to the Starks. So what will happen when a Stark turns up? You know, we've got Rickon Stark suddenly appears in Winterfell, delivered by the you know, small John Umber. So have they totally gone, betrayed the Stark name now? Do they think, well, you know, Rickon's weak and powerless, so there's no point putting anything behind him. We'll just side with Ramsay. We don't know. But that was pretty much the episode. Obviously, next week, I think we see uh, Theon finally gets back to the Iron Islands, so I was right about that, that was where he was heading. Um, so that should be interesting to see if that changes how it turned out in the books, because obviously with Balon Greyjoy dead, and them having uh, the King's Moot to decide who rules, if Fionn turns up, he is the heir to Balon, and if he sides with his sister, they could take over the, the Iron Islands, but then what do they do? <laughs> so... There's a lot, lot, lot happening next week, um, but that that's it for this this episode. Um, that was all that happened. But like I say, an eventful episode. We saw a lot of cool stuff, and there's a lot going on. So we'll have to wait to episode four uh, to see what happens next. But hope you enjoyed the uh, the review and the recap. If you did, um, just about here you will see a subscribe button. Just click on that and uh, subscribe to my channel and. Um, I will see you next time. You guys take care. Bye-bye.